Hey everyone and welcome to another installment of Game of the Month. So this is a video that I do at the start of each month where I talk about all the new to me games I played during the previous month, this one being March 2022, and I rank them from my least favourite to my most favourite. So I have 16 games to talk about and as usual they're quite an eclectic mix ranging from pretty simple family weight games all the way up to your crunchy heavy Euro economic simulation games. So let's get started with my least favourite game in the month. So at number 16, I have Emerald, which is one of those lighter games. In fact, this one is Featherlight. This is an older, really good Dawn design. And it almost feels like a mass market, more like traditional family style game. Um, and kind of has some kind of parallel to a roll and, write, uh, roll and move style game, sorry. But rather than rolling a, a die and moving that many spots, you actually move your pawn a number of spaces equal to the amount of people on that original space. So if you have four people on a spot where you started, you could move four spaces. And the idea is that you're trying to land on these certain spots in order to pick up these treasure cards and then collect sets or just collect points. Um, uh, but the kind of spin on this game is that kind of the the last section of the board goes into this dragon's lair and then basically this dragon is going to pace up and down and if it lands on your spot where your pawn is it can potentially still treasure off you or even wipe that player piece off the board completely. And that's pretty much the um, the crux of the game, very simple, it was just a bit too light for me, a bit too obvious about what you could do and the decisions were very limited, you know you couldn't really um, do much here, it was just feather light and it was just kind of going through the motions to see what happens. So that is why Emerald was at number 16. Now at number 15, another extremely light game with Similo. Uh, so this one is almost like a cooperative deduction style game as one person is going to be the clue giver and then everybody else is trying to work out um, the kind of character that that person is trying to narrow down onto. So you have this grid of um, character cards and they're going to be from different kind of themes. You've got like historical characters or kind of mythological characters or you can even mix them up. And then basically that person in the hot seat is going to be giving these clues based on new cards they're playing and they're going to show if they've got similarities or discrepancies to the person you're trying to uh, narrow down to. And then each round you're kind of trying to eliminate more and more people from this grid to eventually try and get a pinpoint focus on who the person you're trying to find is. Again, that is all the game consists of. Very light, breezy. It's pretty fun. I know I've got no issue with playing it at all, but ultimately it is what it is. You know, it's more of an activity than a game, I think. But for younger children um, and, you know, for just a, a, a true kind of um, time passer, this one does a quite a good job. But yeah, just not my style of game. That is uh, Similo at number 15. At number 14, I have a classic with Bonanza by Uwe Rosenberg. So this one goes all the way back to 1997. And this was a game that really has kind of evaded me. I've never managed to play this one until now. Um, and it's it's got some quite cool ideas and concepts in this one where when you have cards in your hand, you can never manipulate the order of those cards. They have to stay in the exact order that you collected them in. And the idea is that you're trying to collect different sets of these beans and then plant them on these fields to get points. You know, the more you get in a row, the kind of the, the more points you're going to get in return. Um, but I suppose one of the um, main factors of this game is that you can kind of trade the beans with other people to try and fit their, their order of cards or try to get rid of your cards because you don't want them to break up your pattern. And because each round you are forced to play a new bean and if you aren't continuing with one of your existing fields, then you, know, you can potentially lose a lot of points that way, which you don't want to do. And that was kind of where the game fell flat for me because I always felt like the choices were obvious what you had to do because you obviously didn't want to play a certain bean, which meant that often you just give them away and there'd always be someone kind of willing to take them off you. So it didn't really have that creativity and that free reign to do these really cool deals and um, you know strike some cool bargains. It was just kind of pretty obvious what you had to do and just shedding cards was kind of the, the path to victory. So I didn't dislike it. I thought it went on 30% too long. It was like, I think you had played through the deck three times. I think two, twice would have been fine. Um, so yeah, it was um, a bit too long, a bit drawn out. And again, I thought the decisions were fairly obvious in this one, but I know this one is kind of um, immensely popular. It's still, obviously it's quite um, stood the test of time quite well because it is still played quite widely now, but didn't quite land for me. That one is Bonanza. At number 13, I have Martinique, which is a two player pirate theme game with a pretty cool winning condition. So basically you have this big grid of tiles with all these different kind of pirate artifacts on and then you're moving your pawn around a certain amount of spaces and picking up these artifacts as you go, trying to make them match with these public 
kind of um, contracts, I suppose. Um, but there's an alternative winning condition where certain tiles will have these coordinates on them. And whenever you get these coordinates, you're going to find out where the treasure is not. So the more you get, the more you're kind of narrowing down where this treasure potentially is, which is kind of a one of the way you can trump the victory. Because if you ever know exactly where the treasure is, you do not even need to know uh, or even you need to bother about collecting those sets because you automatically win, which is quite cool. You kind of go like all in on that on that strategy. Um, but alternatively, there was another layer to this one where you could give up your pawns by taking them off the grid or leaving yourself no viable options in order to go earlier in the guess order to guess where that treasure is. But doing that will obviously mean that you get a good shot at winning before your opponent does. But if you're not successful, you'll probably give your opponent a better idea where it could be. So it's got some good layers there. I thought the game was quite methodical. It was quite dry in the way it played out, you know, very bitty in the way it worked. But it was a fine, it's kind of a different style of two-player game. I didn't dislike it, but I didn't love it either. It was just okay. That is uh, Martinique. At number 12, I have Glasgow, which is another two-player only game. This one only came out a couple of years ago. This is like a, almost like a rondelle resource management style game as you are building a little town or a city, I'm with Glasgow, I assume, um, communally. So you're working with your opponent to build this town um, in the same bunch of tiles. But when you place these buildings, or these tiles, you point them towards you, showing that you've built that tile. And some of these tiles are going to be like engine building tiles, or these, I think they're called warehouses or factories. And we're meaning that whenever anybody places a new tile on either that row or column, then all the existing factories will be kind of triggered and you'll take in an influx of resources, which I really like that concept. There's also some other ways you can score points in this one, like by building certain tiles that will, um, kind of, if you put them in the corners, they'll get more points. If you put them next to other buildings, you'll get more points. Or if you get all the same type of building, you get more points. So it's kind of got that traditional set collection things and different general or generic tile placement mechanisms that you'll see um, time and time again. Um, I'll tend to, uh, I suppose ultimately, I thought this game was a bit generic in the way it played. I thought it felt like a million other games out there. I thought that the um, engine part of the game, which I, which I, was what really did hook me about the game, I wanted to explore more and see more of. That didn't play a, a big enough part into you know into the strategy or the or the kind of gameplay of the game. It felt like a bit tacked on, and you didn't you didn't really need to build up an engine because all the resources were quite generous anyway because you could collect them quite quickly. So it didn't really feel like you needed to explore that too far, which is kind of where the game fell flat for me. So. There's not anything objectively wrong with this game. It just felt, again, a bit a bit standard and a bit pedestrian. And um, it didn't really excite me. But it's fine. I can see why people would like this one as a kind of a lighter two-player game. Um, but, yeah, ultimately it just fell a bit... Another one that fell a bit flat. At number 11, I have High Score by Rainer Knizia. This one is probably the lightest game on this list. Or maybe Joint Light with Emerald. Uh, this one is simply a dice rolling game. So we have... It's a lot of luck in this game, no massive, massive swings of luck and randomness, which you can't really do much about. But that's kind of where the fun lies in this one. So you essentially, each round of the game, you're going to get this objective card that comes out, which might say, um, you know, roll the highest total value of, of dice, or um, maybe get sets of um, pit values. You get, you know, get a one, two, three, four, five, and a six, or maybe collect sets of ten dice. And basically what you're, do, what you're doing is you're doing that, trying to get the best score as you possibly can and beat your opponents. And the more, the better you do, you get three points, second place you get two points, third place you get one point. That is pretty much all the game is. So just kind of get a new objective and try to roll the best you can. Uh, but there are some kind of um, different twists on each round where, you know, sometimes you can roll, uh, re-roll a certain amount of times, or maybe sometimes you have to store a dice back each round, or sometimes you kind of have to roll all the dice again. So it's kind of got all these little tweaks and all the, obje all the objectives are slightly different to keep it fresh and keep it punchy. And you know, while this, the game is traditionally not something I'd go for, it is quick. Again, I'll stress how punchy and kind of engaging it is because you're always kind of involved in this one. It ticks along at a nice pace and it doesn't outstay its welcome. So I think if you want a simple dice rolling game, this one is quite good and it's gone down pretty well with who I've played this one with. So that is high score at number 11. At number 10, I have Peep Bats, which is a, another Matt Riddle and Ben Pinchback game. And I've been playing some of their titles recently, such as um, Sebastrel and Stella, which I really enjoyed those games. And as I've kind of played those games, people have recommended to me to try out Peep Mats because it's another pretty clever little card game. This one has a kind of a cuter theme to it as you're playing these little birds. Um, and basically, you are trying to collect pairs of birds of a kind of a male and female variety. 
Um, and you're gonna do that by placing cards on either side of these perches and basically the values will determine whether you're gonna beat the value of that of the bird on the perch and take cards or these seed cards, which will be your victory points. But sometimes these seed cards come with penalties, such as these, I think it's like squirrels and blackbirds, which can take either cards from your scoring pile or even take cards from your hand. Um, so I thought the game was a bit, uh, maybe a little bit too obtuse, it didn't quite work as well, or wasn't quite as clever as the other two games I mentioned before. It's still fine, but maybe this one reaches a bit too far to be different, and it's not ultimately um, very intuitive. And I thought sometimes these chain reactions would work, which you couldn't really foresee unless you very meticulously plan things out, which can come back and haunt you. So I did like it. I just certainly didn't love it like I did the other titles, but um, I need to play this one a few more times to get my kind of final thoughts on it. But at the moment, it's not quite re reaching the heights of these other games. So that is Peep Mats at number 10. At number nine, I have Unusual Suspects, which is a silly, almost like a party adjacent style game. Now this one, you are working together, a bit like Similo actually, which I mentioned earlier, trying to deduce down to who this person, uh, the particular character you're trying to find on this grid of uh, grid of characters. And this one, you're gonna do that by placing these clue cards down, which might say things such as, you know, does the person um, read books or does the person go night clubbing? And then basically you're trying to converse with your teammates to see like this person um, does, doesn't or wouldn't um, go to nightclubs, maybe they're old, so you flip all the old people down. Or you know maybe they're not into classical music, so again, maybe you, you flip all the young people over. So all this kind of stuff, like, you're making these big assumptions and stereotypes and things, but sometimes it's quite interesting the conversations you have, and it can create some very funny moments as, um, you know, you, you kind of all sing from the same hymn sheet and you make the same presumptions about people. So it's got that nice novelty fun factor and it's a game that anybody can play and get involved in and generally have a good time. Um, I would say that as much as I um, enjoyed this game, I do think it has a shelf life and you need to kind of keep big spans of time in between each, in between each play to keep it fresh. So this is probably a game I'll play maybe once or twice per year, but it's nice when you have that bigger play account um, where you can get something like this out and everybody's gonna just know what to do and get involved in straight away. So I enjoyed this one. Um, it's gonna stay around for a while and um, I think it's gonna come out on the right occasion for some guaranteed fun. So that is Unusual Suspects at number nine. Uh, at number eight, I have Galaxy Trucker. Now this is a game that I was pretty much anticipating not to like. This is like random, it's unpredictable, it's um, chaotic, and you're normally all those things are big red flags for me, but for some reason it works for Galaxy Trucker. So this game, you are basically building a ship almost in real time as you're collecting all these tiles um, and building this spaceship well, that, which will have like guns on it, it will have storage capacity, it will have these rocket boosters, all these different things. And you want to have a good balance of all of them because you need to travel fast, but you need to fight off all these different kind of um, threats and things but you're under pressure to do this. So you can't really think too carefully about what you do and it ends up becoming a bit of a chaotic mess. But ultimately, once everybody's built their ship, you're gonna basically weather the storm and see what happens to your ship. You know, maybe these asteroids are gonna come and attack you. Maybe you're gonna go to these um, different planets and try to pick up certain trade goods. But if you don't have the storage capacity, then you can't take them. So it's got all these things that you just kind of play, sit back and see what happens and enjoy the chaos. Things are constantly kind of come and bombard your ship and maybe knock off whole parts of your ship and things. But you know, despite that being again wild and unpredictable, I thought it worked for the game. It was a lot of fun just to see how the game developed and see what happened. So yeah, I enjoyed this one a lot. I think it's um, another game that maybe goes a round or two too long. I would say maybe go straight into just building a big ship rather than doing a small one, then a medium one, then a bigger one. It kind of felt a bit unnecessary. Um, I think you could probably narrow it down to maybe a small one and a big one, or maybe just the big one. That would you get the whole experience uh, nonetheless. And um, you know, it's so random that I wouldn't even care that if that worked against you. You don't really need to play the best of three. At number seven, I have Metropolis, which is an older Istari, pretty dry Euro game. This one is an area majority and bidding style game that works quite a bit differently to any other bidding game that I've seen. So you have basically this big um, map made of all these different regions. And within these regions, you've got these different kind of segments of different terrain types. And at the start of the game, each of you are gonna get a number of different objectives. So you're gonna get one relating to a terrain type, which might say, you know, get on the red pieces of terrain. Or you've got, and you've also got another objective color, which might say, maybe get th three of your buildings around 
a fountain or maybe get on each side of a bridge and you're basically trying to uh, um, achieve those goals secretly and not give them away to the other players but the way you do that is that you're going to start an auction based on a certain place a region that you pick and you place a skyscraper marker on them and then all those skyscrapers are going to have different values on them I think ranging from one all the way up to like 13 I think and when you place that marker on there um, let's say I placed a three down then anybody can raise that three but you don't actually bid for the region that you start with you only you continue it from an adjacent region so you're constantly snaking out as the bids are being raised which kind of creates this really dynamic board state and as more and more of these regions are being gobbled up and claimed by the other players it creates a tighter and tighter board meaning that sometimes you can place these buildings right on spots with no options to spread out to other people or to other places meaning that you can automatically win that bid with a very low value. So this one game, game did have a very nice game arc and a good crescendo to it. And the decisions became more and more crunchy as the game went on. You know, pacing yourself how to place those bids and things was a good decision space. So this one I thought was a very clean and elegant mechanically, um, a lot of fun and some good decisions here, but it did have a few issues. Um, number one, I didn't think all the objective cards were very balanced to be honest. Um, and additionally, there wasn't much replayability because there wasn't a tremendous amount of objective and things. So I thought that the amount of times you could play this one were pretty limited. So these were the kind of things that um, kind of made me think that this isn't going to stick around for a long time. But objectively, I think the game is very well designed and there's certainly a lot of potential here. And I know that there is going to be a kind of a remastering of this one under a different title. I think it's called High Rise or something like that. Um, so I'm quite interested to see what happens when it gets reprinted. Because again, this core mechanism of raising bids and spreading out to adjacent regions is really engaging and I like it a lot. So that is Metropolis at number seven. So let's get into my shields of quality. So these are games that I would quite confidently recommend to most people. So at number six, the first game with my shield of quality is Kaching, which is a game that pretty much nobody knows about. This is from over 20 years ago, a very simple little economic two player game. And it's a drafting style game. So this one you're gonna have five columns of seven cards kind of overlapping each other and um, with these different numbers on them and different colors as well. And basically all you do on your turn is you either draft a card from the kind of pinnacle of one of these columns or you can sell a pair of duplicate or, or cards of the same color. So let's say um, I draft a, a, a red six and a red three. That's gonna cost me nine money because again, the six and the three. But then when it comes to a later turn, I can sell those together and multiply the scores together. So it's gonna be the six times the three for 18. So I've pretty much doubled my money for doing so. And that's basically how the game works. You're gonna keep picking up and selling cards and the person with the most money at the end wins. But this is really one of those games where there are times where you're pretty much paralyzed and you don't want to do anything because no matter what you do is gonna benefit your opponent. So it's kind of choosing the, the best of a bad bunch of options. And that tenseness and the, the kind of, um, you know, ferociousness of the um, of the draft is really there and it shines through so strong in this game and this is a game that's really been kind of lost to the annals of time it should be more known about known about it's so accessible but it's it's crunchy it's interesting and considering this game is like 15 minutes or so and I think it's really affordable if you live in the states so I'd highly recommend picking it up if you if you if you do live in the states because you're going to get it for a very good price um, but yeah, the, this is a, probably the best experience you can get of, of gameplay in 10 to 15 minutes. Just that that ratio is off the charts. So ultra good game. And I thank Mackenzie from Side Game um, LLC big time for recommending this one to me because it is a fantastic little game that I think more people should be playing. So that is Kaching at number six. At number five, I have The Fog Escape from Paradise. So this one was actually running on Kickstarter. It's been taken down from Kickstarter for um, a reason I don't really want to get into. Um, but it's due, it's, I, think, I think it's going to get relaunched sooner or later. But this one is like a an abstract, almost like a racing area majority style game as you're trying to be this bunch of, um, basically these tribesmen, I suppose, uh, rushing through these crowds and getting onto a very limited um, capacity boat in order to score victory points. But all the meanwhile, this fog is encroaching on the board and potentially engulfing um, all the player pieces of a certain row. So you need to make sure you're constantly pushing the people at the back forward so that you don't get swallowed by the fog. 
but additionally you want to move your people forward forward because you want to get the best spots on the boat so it had this really cool tension to it and basically gameplay is like manipulating the different um, tokens on the board so you're kind of switching places with others you're jumping over obstacles you know all that kind of thing you know squeezing through gaps and this game really does come alive when you start introducing these sand timers that come with the game to put all your moves under pressure because this one is like a an action points allowance style game which you don't really see much nowadays you know we have say six or seven action points and you can spend them as you see fit and Normally those games lend themselves to a lot of AP because you can very carefully math things out. But, th but this one, when you put that timer into play, you need to just start moving and not think too much and get things down to a T. And that creates that, all that chaos really works for the game. That frantic nature fits the theme as well. This game should be known about. I think it's going to be a big hit when it does come out eventually and the word of mouth spreads, spreads about it. And I'm very um, kind of honoured that I got a chance to play this one and was and was um, provided a, a review copy by the um, by the publisher because it's a it's a wonderful game and I think it should be more known about and hopefully the Kickstarter will be launched again soon. So that is the Fog Escape from Paradise. At number four, I definitely have the most crunchy game on this list. This is Crystal Palace. So this is a game that's been on my shelf of shame for a long, long time and I've been really eager to play this one and finally got this one played. So this one is um, a dice placement style game but this one you can actually choose the pit values of these dice and you can allocate them to these different worker placement spots. Um, but each pit that you put face up, you know, the higher ones being better, you know, if you're putting sixes up, it's great because you're going to get to the best spots. But you have to pay a pound for each pit that you have. And money in this game is so tight. This one must be probably one of the most tight games I've ever played in terms of the economy, you know, getting money into your system. And um, basically what you're doing is you're collecting these invention cards, you're getting these helpers, um, all to get victory points uh, and, and ongoing uh, kind of abilities and things. Um, you're constantly trying to increase your income track because each round it gets knocked down three spots, meaning that you get less and less money each round. Um, you are trying to fill up your player board as well because you start with a big bunch of negative points and you can get these kind of engine building benefits by you know, maybe getting money and stuff each round or getting resources. And that's pretty much what the game is. You know, if you if you go into a game expecting to like a, you know, an economic game, this one is going to deliver. If you are on the fence or not such a big fan of dry economic euros, then this one isn't going to be one that changes your mind. So it's kind of one of those games where you know you get what's you get what's kind of assumed of it. But despite that, I think the game is very good. It does have a few issues, like I think it's or the scope and potential for analysis paralysis is huge in this one because again, you have to very carefully map things out by how much can you bid, how much money do you need to leave back in order to pay your staff because you can get forced into taking loans and loans are gonna be pretty crippling in terms of victory points. But there's so much going on here, I can't really talk about all about it. I've recorded my review already, so be prepared for that one to drop pretty soon. Uh, at number four, Three, I have Rumble Nation, another game that you don't really hear talked about too much. This one is a pretty simple, almost like a filler area control area majority style game. But this one is uh, pretty has a, a really cool game mark where you just build, 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 resolve, and then the game is over. So this one only takes about 30 minutes to play. But the way you are claiming these different regions is that you're going to roll three dice and then you're going to separate those dice into a pair and a single die. And basically the two the two dice are going to show which region you're going to go into and the one die on its own is going to show how many cubes of your type you're going to put into that region to try and control it. And basically back and forth you're going to keep doing this until everybody's placed all their cubes then in turn order or in number order all these different regions are going to get resolved. And then the cool thing about this game is that when each region is resolved, the winner of each region, you know, the person with the most cubes in, generates two more cubes and spits them into each of the adjacent regions to the one already resolved. So it has this kind of cool cascading domino effect where one region is going to affect the other regions. And knowing how to map that out and strategically plan on you know, which regions you need to win to influence other regions is where the decision space and the game really shines. Such an interesting concept. Surprised that I've not seen this mechanism used before. Streamlined to the bone, very accessible, a lot of fun, and still some good decision here without being too much, not being too, um, not being too much to swallow at once because you know you are pretty much trying to vision what you can do, 
you know, splitting those um, splitting those dice into two and a one, maybe getting one re-roll if you want to, and that's pretty much your options. So again, a really good balance of being accessible, but still being interesting. And um, this one was a big hit for me, and I'm very happy to have this one in my collection. You might have to reach a bit further to get a copy of this one because I don't think it's available, or not widely available in English. At number two, I have Nauticus by Kramer and Kiesling. This one is a game that nobody talks about. This one is another example of a game being lost to time. Um, came out in 2013. Don't hear anybody talking about this one anymore, but by God, they should be. This game is fantastic, and Kramer and Kiesling doing what they do best, creating simple but interesting, clever Euro games that fit that medium light bracket. This one achieves that, and this one you're basically trying to build these boats, build the sails that go onto the boats, load them up with cargo, all the game are getting victory points. The way you do your actions in this game is interesting and it works almost like a, a Puerto Rico race for the galaxy system where on a player's turn, you're selecting one of these different actions um, and then everybody gets to take that action, but the person selecting it gets another bonus, which could be like more money or stronger actions, that kind of thing. And again, you're trying to build these ships, you're trying to build big ones because the big ships are going to give you a massive chunk of points at the end of the game. But the smaller ones are also great because it means that you can get these one-off boons really quickly and get some a nice little um, kick of resources or a nice little uh, kind of a, a tactical boost. So striking the balance between the two is really interesting. And I also had this interesting rule that I've never seen before where you'd start, or, or each round you'd default start with these three negative point tokens, a, three, a minus three points, a minus two one, and a minus one token. And whenever you forsake, or when you, whenever you forsook taking an action, you could basically flip one of these tiles over, meaning, meaning that you're no longer losing those points. I thought that was really cool, you know, understanding is it worth me taking this action and potentially suffering these negative points, or should I get rid of the action and not take one this round, and but flip one of these negative points tokens down and not have to worry about it. Never seen that use before, and I think it should be used more, uh, more often because I thought it was a really interesting decision to make, and um, I thought this game flowed beautifully. Um, you know, that perfect mid-weight Euro, and um, I would love to have this in my collection, but uh, my friend's got a copy, but this is one of his games that I'd happily play any time. It was a lot of fun, and um, my style of game. That is Nauticus. And finally, at number one, the only game this month with my Elite Shield, so this is my highest commendation. This goes to Bora Bora by Stefan Feld. So this one has really been that grail game for me for a long time. Very hard to get a copy of this one. I went the extra mile to track it down, but I'm very glad I did because the gameplay in this game is fantastic. This is Stefan Feld doing what Stefan Feld does best. These dry, mechanical, point salad style games. And that additional wrinkle of this one being dice driven is just, uh, it's just everything I want and more. Um, I love the action selection system in this game as when you place um, a die on these action spots, the higher pit values are great because they get you stronger actions, but the lower ones are also great because they give you flexibility to go where you want because each time you take an action um, where somebody's already taken, you have to decrease the pit value. So if someone places a six, you can only place a five, four, three, two, a one, or if somebody places a two, you can only place a one. So the lower ones are not such strong actions, but they give you that flexibility to go where you want. And what you're trying to do in this game is you're trying to kind of spread your influence on this island, getting resources, um, building these buildings in like a Castles of Burgundy style fashion where the earlier you do them, the more points you're getting. You've got some simple airy majority. You've got some kind of resource management as you're collecting these shells to buy jewelry and things. And I also love this ongoing thread of strategy you'd have in the game where each round you'd have a number of these short-term objectives that you're trying to achieve. And if you achieve one of them each round, then you get a big bunch of points as well. So I love everything this game has to offer. I can't really find of a single thought about it. Good strategy, good tactical decisions, and you're know, bouncing the two, you know, short-term and long-term gains is where this game really shines. Loved everything about it. This is like a top tier Feld game for me, and um, I think it's brilliant and definitely worth that kind of, um, I suppose, you know, sometimes games get an amount of hype about them because they are so hard to get hold of. This one, I think the gameplay transcends that, and it's certainly worth um, worth the hype and the uh, the excitement people have about this game, not just because it is hard to get. So hopefully this one will get reprinted soon um, because it certainly deserves it. That is Bora Bora, my best game of the month. So that concludes the list. I really hope you've enjoyed the video. I always enjoy making these videos. Um, nice to talk about a big range of games and hopefully this has been somewhat informative to you. If you, have, if you do enjoy my content, please um, consider subscribing to the channel, um, checking out my other videos, hitting like, all that good stuff. But for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye now.